Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that as we begin this Bible prophecy class and symbols that you'll continue watching over us and also bring upon the knowledge into our minds that we can know how to interpret your scripture. We just ask for a blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, we're back number two for Bible symbols of Bible prophecy. And uh, this week, all the scriptures are going to be right. <laughs> Not that they weren't last week, but we just had a couple. They were a little different. But we're all good for this week. So last week we ended off at what? Does anyone remember? <coughs> we ended off at colors, right? Okay, so for those of you who requested the the symbol sheet, uh, I, would, I would say have it right in front of you so you could take notes on it. Um, we talked about... Um, uh, mainly just animals and what they mean in Bible prophecy last week we talked about what the horns represent beasts rams doves tongues serpents lions bears uh, beasts dragons horses oh my we talked about all that stuff and what they mean in Bible prophecy so this week we're gonna try and cover uh, colors and metals and the reason why we need to cover this first before we dive into Bible prophecy is so that we fully understand what the Bible is talking about uh, when it mentions these symbols. Now, obviously, when we're going to go through Bible prophecy, we're going to stop and explain. Uh, so it's always going to be repetitive when we get to these symbols and then we study prophecy itself. Um, so let's start off with uh, the colors here. We start off with white. And not only, we're going to do the same thing as last week. Not only are we going to talk about uh, the colors and what they mean but I'll give a little bit more background as it goes into scripture as well so the first one if you look there on your uh, your paper uh, we look at the color white what does white mean it should be pretty obvious it means uh, purity and conquest and white here is not to be confused with pale okay because in Revelation you have white and pale Pale is something completely different, um, and we'll get to that at another time. But what is white? So let's look at the book of Psalms. It's in your Old Testament. Psalms, and we're going to look at chapter 51, verse 7. And I might call on some of you to uh, read the scriptures as well. My throat's feeling uh, a lot better this week, so you should be okay there. So Psalms 51 verse 7. Now, I have to, let me give this, um, um, let me let you know on this. When it comes to Bible symbols, the instruction on what something means in the Bible is not always going to have the word, okay? So we're studying white, right? I told you it means purity. It also means conquest. But when you get your definitions of what white means, it might not have in the scripture verse, um, like the scripture might not say it's going to be white as the driven snow or uh, purity or like his pureness of heart is so white like snow. It's sometimes it's not going to use the exact word that you're trying to define. It uses the understanding of the word. While other places say yes, it's the exact word, there's other scriptures that are going to tell you something different. This is why you have to look at the context. I tell you this because I'm reading mainly verses that have to do with the word, but as now you have your list, if you go through the list yourself, there's a bunch more scriptures that, that, uh, that are mentioned here that actually talk about the essence of what the word means, not so much putting the word literally in the scripture verse. I hope that makes sense to you. If it doesn't, just tell me. Um, but here in Psalms 51 verse 7, it says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So in this instance, it's, it's using the word whiter than snow. But in the verse itself, does it say that white is a symbol for purity? Does it say that in the verse? Does it say that you'll become white and pure no it doesn't but here in the verse what does it say you have to look at key words purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean 
wash me and I shall be whiter than the snow. What are the key words to let you know it's talking about purity? Well, it's talking about washing. It says wash me. It's talking about purge me. It's talking about I shall be clean and I shall be whiter than snow. We all know that snow is white, right? So what is this verse telling you? It's trying to make you cleaner than snow, whiter than white snow, right? So it's a, it's a sense of purity. And this is why I mentioned that on many texts, you're not going to find it say it straight out, but in the context of the verse, it's going to tell you what it means. This is very important because people, when it comes to Bible symbols, especially uh, context on time when it comes to prophecy, uh, we tend to not see these things. Uh, so we tend to misapply the prophecy time or misapply what the meaning truly is. Okay, so let's take another one. Isaiah 1 18. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18 speaking about white. And we're not going to go through all of these. Isaiah 1 18. It says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So there it's talking not so much about purity, but if you understand the context of what it's talking about, yes, it's talking about purity. It's talking about making yourself being white as snow. As it says there, though your sins be as scarlet. So what does that represent? You're having sin as representation of of uh, the of, of bad things, right? And how were your sins washed away and taken away through the blood of Jesus, right? So by initiating red blood, that makes you white as snow or whiter than snow, and it cleanses you. And it also talks about uh, they shall be uh, as wool as well, which wool is white, right? Okay, so it's making even reference to the lamb uh, without blemish. That it was completely white right so it's making those those references now I'm giving you this background because it's good that we know these things and later on as we go into the actual studies you're gonna see them even more clear and I hope you remember these things okay so let's go move on to the next color next color you'll find there is blue now there's a very interesting study here on on the, the color blue for those of you who are on the Facebook page, you could just look at my sermon that I did in regards to the color blue. Uh, I believe I um, entitled it the uh, Blue Sapphire Stone, I believe it is. For those of you who want the notes on that sermon, I could probably send it to you um, so you can find out about the color blue. But what does it represent? Let's look at Numbers 15. Numbers 15. It's in your Old Testament towards the beginning. Right after uh, Leviticus, right before Deuteronomy. So Numbers 15, what does the color blue represent? And the color blue represents not only what we're going to talk about, but it has an even more of a meaning, uh, the color blue. Um, you'll also find it in, um, in the Bible. It's not necessarily said blue, but sapphire, which is the same color. Okay, so blue. Numbers 15, 37 through 41. Numbers 15, 37 through 41. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes on the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the border a ribbon of blue. Okay, so according to Moses, so far in the text, that throughout the generations, okay guys, so remember, you're supposed to do this right now, right? <laughs> it's not so much now, it was more for back then. But throughout the generations, they were taught that on the fringe of their garments, which is what? The edge of your garments, right? So whether it be on the bottom of your dress, the bottom of your, I forget what the guys call it, whatever the case may be, even possible on, on your round parts around your, your wrist, but it's mainly on the bottom. They're put to put little fringe tassels on the fringe, little tassels of blue, and there was a purpose for that. So let's keep on reading. Why blue? What's the blue supposed to represent? Um, let's start in verse 38 where we left off, where it says, uh, "Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes on the borders of their garments." 
throughout their generations that they put upon the fringe of all their borders a ribbon of blue, and it shall be upon you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it and remember what does it say? All the commandments of the Lord, and to do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. So what was the purpose of these fringes? What was the purpose of it being the color blue? Now the main point of this is to represent the law of God. When they saw these fringes, the reason why it was blue is because they were to remember the law of God. But it was also to remind them not to go back to the ways that they were before um, uh, when they were in Egypt. Okay, They are to remember how God took them out of Egypt and how he's... Uh, caring for them how he took care of them in the wilderness but mainly what happened at mount sinai when he gave them the law of god this is why they would have blue in their in the fringes of their garment forever it was to remember the law of god now how does this i'm just going to do this anyway because it's very important and i might not say it later on but how does does this relay in bible prophecy because when you see the two symbols of the women that are at the in the last days, the good church and the bad church, the false woman or false church is actually missing the color blue. She has scarlet, she has gold, she has precious pearls, she has all these different colors, gold, the same as uh, the true church, but she's missing the color gold, which symbolizes the commandments because the last day church, which is the church of the Antichrist, does not keep nor does it teach the law of God. Now, also, why is the does the law? Um, it, or excuse, I'm mixing my words here. Why is the law represented in the color blue? Uh, as most of us who are Adventists know, blue is the foundation of we believe of God's character, of God's whole system of governance, right? Well, why is that? Well, when you look at the book of Exodus and you look at a certain portion in the book of Ezekiel, you'll find that the very uh, color blue not only is a representation of the commandments, but Ezekiel tells us it's a re representation of God's very throne. God's throne where Jesus sits is actually a blue sapphire stone. Now, why is that important? Because the book of Exodus tells us, I believe it's chapter 24, that when Moses uh, got the Ten Commandments from God, God carved the, the Ten Commandments stone out of the stone that's made of his throne. And even when he broke the first tablets and they made a second set, it was still carved out of the same sapphire stone that's in the throne of God. So why are the commandments the foundation of God's governance, the foundation of his character? Because it's the very stone that he sits on, right? Not only in principle by the commandments, but the very stone, which is all blue. So that's why it has such a big, big significance in Bible prophecy. Okay, what about purple? Any questions? No? Okay, purple. What does it mean? It means, according to Mark 15, verse 17, which we're going to read, and another verse in Judges, Mark 15, verse 17. You turn with me there. <clears throat> Mark 15, verse 17. And they clothed him with purple and painted a crown of thorns and put it about his head now what does purple represent now this what we just read here in mark is actually what they did to jesus while he was on the cross right they put a crown of thorns on him they draped him in purple they were really mocking him with this purple but the reason why they are mocking him is because purple is supposed to be a representation of royalty and what was on top of uh, uh that was nailed on top of the cross of right above jesus's head it was a sign that had three forms of writing right saying basically this is the king of the jews so they wanted to give him that clothing of royalty although they were really using it to disgrace him it was really it's what it represented jesus was royalty he's god now let's look at judges verse uh, chapter 8 verse 26 judges chapter 8 verse 26 
Okay, Judges 8, verse 26. And it says, And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold, besides ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was of the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were about their camel necks. So whenever you find Bible, you'll and whenever you find purple in the Bible, it's going to be a symbol of royalty, whether it's regarding um, God's people or actually people of other lands, uh, such as here, as it says, of the people of the Midians. So purple is a symbol of royalty. And you can see that even throughout time, even through today. I mean, the majority of time today, you'll see that red is actually a symbol of, of royalty. But it's really the tradition is purple. Even if you look amongst the popes, the cardinals, a lot of them wear red. But when it comes to um, symbolic ceremonies of uh, showing your allegiance or uh, say a death, a lot of them dress themselves in purple or, or they'll have a purple sash. You've probably seen some pastors who, uh, different parts of denominations who wear robes, they'll have a purple sash, and they'll have actually several different colors to represent different things. But it's a symbol of royalty. Okay, um, let's look at the color red or scarlet. They, they're used uh, pretty much as the same. So let's look at Isaiah 118. Isaiah 118. If you're having a hard time finding Isaiah, just basically get your Bible and turn it in half and you'll come near the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 118. And it says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they're though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What is red and what does scarlet symbolize? It symbolizes sin and corruption. Here in the verse, Isaiah is telling us that so your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson, meaning still talking about your sins. So scarlet and red is used as a symbol of of sin now let's look at one other verse revelation 17 1 through 4 revelation 17 1 through 4 if you're having a hard time finding revelation it's at the first book of your bible Okay, some of you got that, that are paying attention. <laughs> okay, Revelation 17, 1 through 4. <laughs> I want to make sure everyone's awake. Okay, Revelation 17, 1 through 4, we're looking at scarlet and red. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting upon, now listen to this, this is the false woman of Revelation 17, right? This woman is sitting upon a scarlet colored beast, right? Okay, so this beast has full sin, right? This whole beast is sinful. Full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Remember we talked about these different animals. And we talked about some having many horns and heads. And a woman was raised in purple. What does purple represent? Royalty. So this false church that comes in the last days is, uh, is going to be a beast. Okay, this woman is riding a beast. A woman is a church. And she's riding a beast. What did we learn last week was a beast. It was a kingdom, right? So this woman has a has a kingdom. She's on top. She's part of this kingdom. And she's ruling this kingdom. That's why she's writing it. She sits upon this, um, this kingdom that's full of sin, full of names of blasphemies, having seven heads and ten horns. What did we learn about those horns yeah, uh, last week? 
Then there are kings or kingdoms, right? So it's just similar like a beast. And the woman was raised in purple, which means what? Royalty. So this woman has some type of power. This church has power over this land. And scarlet color. So not only does it the, is the beast, the kingdom, the 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 nation full of sin. Oops. But it says here that that nation has royalty and it's also a scarlet color. So in a sense it's giving it's giving both examples of sinfulness and a lot of times when the Bible repeats itself, it repeats itself cuz it wants to emphasize either how bad or how good or how important this detailed topic is. And here it's mentioning about this woman that not only is she riding a sinful beast, which means this church is is ruling over this uh, sinful place, this kingdom, but she also has, uh, she's dressed in purple, so she has rule, power, and authority over this place, and she has a scarlet color, and she's decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So here in the verse 4, it gives a description of what she's arrayed with, right? And what that means is what's on her, what she's colored with, what she's wearing, stuff like that. And as I mentioned earlier, she has a lot of the same symbols as God's people, except she's missing that color that represents the law, which is blue. And we will go through this later on when we're talking about the mark of the beast and the true church and stuff like that through prophecy. Okay, so red and scarlet represent sin. Purple represents royalty. Blue represents the law. White represents purity. And our last color of black. Now, there are many other colors, but they're intertwined with other things. So that's why we only have these few that we're covering right now. Uh, black. And it's supposed to be a symbol of famine. So let's turn to Revelation 6. And we're going to read verse 5 and 6. Revelation 6, verse 5 and 6. And it says... And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on, on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil or the, and the wine. So what is being transitioned here like? This is why I mentioned earlier, Sometimes in the verse, it doesn't mention uh, the what the interpretation you're looking for. We're talking about black, right? Did it mention black in the verse? Yes, it does. But it doesn't say that black is actually talking about a famine. It doesn't say, okay, well, everything turned black and then there was a famine. No, it doesn't say that, right? But when we look in the context of the verse and allow the key words to pop out in the verse... We can see that it's actually talking about a famine. So let's look at it again. So, and when he had opened the third seal. Okay, this is another part of prophecy. But we're not going to get into it. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. So there's the word, right? Black. What is it referring to? Someone could say, well, it's referring to a horse because it's talking to a black horse. Okay, so what's the representation of this black horse? As we read, it tells us the interpretation. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hands. Now, I don't know if I could get... Do you guys know what a pair of balances is? No? No? Yes, no, some of you, thumbs up. Okay, there's not everyone has video. It's a weight imbalances. It's it's uh, when you have a, um, I have one actually here. <laughs> I don't want to get up and get it. it, it ha it's just, it's basically a scale, right? You put one weight on one side and if they're even, they stay at the same way. If one's heavier than the other, what? They change, right? Now, it says that this uh, black horse appeared and there was someone riding on it. And what does that someone writing represent? It says, And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hands. So there's a rider on a black horse holding a pair of balances. Right? Okay, let me put my hands in the proper place. Holding a pair of balances. Now what is he actually talking about? 
what was balances used for in the Old Testament symbology? It was used for weighing of grain. Because as we today, we use money to buy and sell. Back then, they didn't use money. They used jewels or they used grain, right? Crops, things that they the things that they that they grew. So verse 6, look. I heard a voice in the middle of the four beasts say, what is he talking about? A measure, which what does the weight and balances do? It measures, right? A measure of wheat for a penny. So penny, uh, a penny's worth of wheat and three measures of barley for a penny. And see that thou heard not the oil and the wine. What is the verse in the scripture text talking about? It's talking about food. Food that's being sold and traded. Now, this black horse is coming with a weight and measure. And what is he doing? He's weighing the measures of the of food that's going to be available for sale. Now, when you read in context of this whole what's happening here in this verse, it talks about the famine. Now, a famine is what? A famine is when there's not so much food for the people that are alive, right? Now, can you remember another story where it talks about weights and balances? Do you remember the story in Daniel chapter 5, I believe it is? My memory is kind of going today. Memory, uh, Daniel chapter 5, what happened in chapter 5? You have the king was overruled, or not overruled, but overtaken by Cyrus, the Medes and Persians, right? But prior to Cyrus coming in and taking over the kingdom of Babylon what was written on the wall by the hand of God. Many, many tekel eupharsin, right? You have found wanting and have been weighed in the balances. And when the Bible refers to you being weighed in the balances, what transpires? Loss of goods or some type of loss. And the king of Belteshazzar of Babylon, what did he lose? He lost his kingdom. Here it's talking about loss of food, loss of famine here in Revelation chapter 6. And like I said, context is key. You have to continue reading before and after to know the story. But black is also known as what? As death, right? So it's a loss of life. It's also, in this sense, it's a famine because a famine is a loss of food. Okay, any questions before we move on? anything okay so let's move on to metals elements and natural objects okay some of these are mainly common sense but we still have to do our due diligence and go through them okay metals elements and natural objects I just want to show you guys something real quick if I can find it here it goes I'm not sure on the page how it's going to show here or the or zoom so let me do this yeah it turned me completely around okay there it goes okay so have any of you ever seen this before here I'll hold it up close to one camera can you see that at all and here's for the group page now I got these as a gift these are actually the stones of the New Jerusalem so when you read in the book of Revelation how it talks about the foundation stones of the of the of the of the new kingdom these are actually the foundation stones and these are some of the ones we're gonna study I just wanted to show you guys these cuz I've 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 never seen these other than back east where Jessica's family is from so I've never seen them here so I I just wanted to show you that because we're studying metals elements and natural objects which are some possibly some of the stones that the foundation is going to cover and what their meanings are okay so let's start off with gold what does gold mean let's look at Isaiah 13 verse 12 Isaiah 13 verse 12 Isaiah 13 verse 12 what does gold mean gold if you look on your sheet there is supposed to represent a pure character or precious and rare 
Now, we all know that gold is very rare, right? That's why it's an expensive metal. That's why many people spend their lives trying to find it and uh, put their lives at risk trying to find it. But what does Isaiah 13 verse 12 say? It says, I will make a man more precious than fine gold. Now, is gold one of the most precious metals here on earth? Yes, it is. And what does Isaiah tell us that, that God wants to do with mankind? Make more precious than fine gold, right? Um, even a man than the golden wedge of the Ophir. I forget what that means. But Marissa, just to answer your question, um, I, it was gifted to me by my wife's grandparents. This is where I got this. Uh, I can ask him where you can order it. Um, I forget exactly where you can order it from. Um, but you can order them, I think. This, they got this like some, maybe some 30 years ago or something like that. Um, but you can order them, I believe so. So, but here Isaiah talks about gold being precious and rare. Now, Isaiah says that God wants to make man more precious than gold. Which means, in a sense, mankind is the most valuable thing here on earth. It's not gold, it's not any other types of metal, it's not diamonds, it's not rubies, but it's mankind. Now let's look at Malachi 3.3. Malachi 3.3, just right before the New Testament there. Malachi 3.3. It's a small book, sometimes you pass it. Malachi 3.3. And ye shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And ye shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold in the silver. And they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So it's talking about a purification process that's going on here. It's not talking about burning the Levites or who are the priests like they would burn gold. Like how many of you have ever seen gold being purified or silver being purified? Basically what's done, it's heated to a certain temperature to where, especially gold or silver, when it's heated to that temperature, the reason why you're heating it is to make it liquid, but you're also heating it in order to purify it. Because there's there's um, um, types of uh, elements that are inside the gold that are actually, in a sense, uh, what's the proper word? I cannot think for, for anything today. Think about this. Say you have a beautiful yard, right? In order to make it beautiful, it has to look nice and neat. But what happens when weeds come up? Well, it makes it look awful, right? Some people think so, especially a lot of us here. So what do you have to do? You have to pluck them out. I thought about the right word. When you're when you're heating up gold, you're burning out the impurities that are inside that gold. It's not that the gold has impurity itself. It's just while the gold was in the ground, it got mixed with other elements which are impure. And it's less valuable if it has those impurities in there. So what they do, they heat it up to where it becomes liquid. But not just liquid, they heat it up so much to where gold becomes transparent. And silver becomes transparent to where you can completely see through the liquid gold. And that's when you know that all the impurities have been burnt out. It's interesting to note that here in Malachi, it talks about heating up a person's character, meaning you're on fire with God and you're studying and you're learning about God. That when you do that, you're actually pushing out all the impurities in your life because you're actually learning and following God that those bad things of your life that you like and you, that you do are actually going away where you're purifying your character to where eventually they say you're going to be just like gold. You're going to be that preciousness. That's why uh, Isaiah talked about God wanting to make man more precious than gold. Well, if gold has to go through a refining process of burning out the impurities, so does mankind have to go through that same refinery process by getting rid of the impurities. And what are the impurities? Sin right it's called the christian walk a day-by-day -day life with christ to where we get rid of those things that that paul talks about that that hold us down right those are our impurities in life so the same process that you would see as making gold pure making silver pure is the same process we have to go through except for gold deals with uh um fire in itself while we deal with a different type of fire that, that burns out the impurities. And what's that type of fire? 
the Holy Spirit inside of our lives, right? Working through our lives. So it, it wants us to be a precious, God wants us to be precious, more precious than gold. And gold is a purifying character, that's what it means. And God wants us to make us more pure than gold. Then we have silver. It's basically the same thing. We already read the the similar text. It does give us a couple different ones, but it's the same process. Whether it's gold or silver, God wants us to be better than that and more precious in His sight. So He has to put us through the refining process. Okay, so what about brass, tin, iron, lead, silver? It's talking about an impure character. While gold and silver are used as pure characters, you'll find that brass, tin, iron, lead are actually impure characters. Now think upon this, those of you who already know about Daniel chapter 2, right? You have the, the, the statue, right, that's made of different metals, and it starts as a pure, uh, uh, expensive me uh, metal, which is get the head of gold, and it goes down in value and in value and in value while it changes different metals, right? Notice the first two here, we're told that gold and silver are pure character, they're precious and pure words. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, well, how was Medo-Persia and Babylon pure with God? How did God, uh, uh, how could we say that they're pure when they both worship pagan idols and stuff like that? But if you look at the statue of Daniel, right? This little, this little guy right here. If you look at the statue of Daniel, the different representations of kingdoms as you go down the way, who did God work through with the most? Did God work with Babylon? Did he? Well, according to the book of Jeremiah, the reason why the, the God's people went into captivity was because of their sinfulness, and God was going to use Babylon, which is the head of gold, in order to bring his people back to him. He was going to use Babylon to put him in captivity, and then eventually Babylon was going to let him go, and, the, and then they would become God's people again. So did God use gold to refine his people? Yes, he did. And how did he do it? Through captivity. Did God use Medo-Persia as silver to refine the characters? While gold in... Um, while the Babylonian kingdom are the ones who initially brought God's people back into slavery in, in Babylon, it wasn't Babylon that let them go. It was actually the king of Middle Persia uh, that let them go. So both kingdoms are known as purifying agents to represent the character of God. And in the image, God used both nations of Babylon and Middle Persia, which are representing the two elements as those two elements that would purify his people so when they were ready for the prophecy to end the end the 70 the 70 years for it to end they would be purified and go back and start over and be God's people again but what would transition after that between the Greeks and the and the Romans they're a lesser metal no one really cares about brass or iron although iron is used to make great things it's not an expensive metal, neither is bronze. Why? God never did anything with these two. These two, Satan used these two kingdoms in order to go against God's people. He used these two kingdoms to push down and persecute God's people, especially the Romans, which are the legs of iron, which symbolize Rome. So here you have, and I've never heard anybody say that before either, so... You know, this is probably the first <laughs> you've ever heard about it, right? So mark it down, write a picture, take a, you know, all that good stuff. Ray said it first. Okay, so even in the book of Daniel with the images of the statue in chapter 2, God showing us that the pureness of gold and silver are actual representations in Bible prophecy through the two kingdoms that God used to purify his people. Then in the next, in brass, tin, leads, uh, lead, uh, the devil used that. That's why it's an impure character. So let's look at the book of Ezekiel. It's right after the book of Daniel. Or right before the book of Daniel. Yeah, it's right before the book of Daniel. We're going to be looking at Ezekiel 22.20. Ezekiel 22, verse 20 and 21. 
It says, as they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it, to melt it, so will I gather you in my anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire for my wrath, and ye shall be melted in the midst thereof. So, I know it mentions silver there. But it's talking about silver in another aspect. But here in the first two, it's talking about purifying. But when it mentions all these, the brass, the tin, the iron, and silver all together, what's transpiring in verse in the verse 21? Is there a purifying that's going on? No, it's not a purifying. What does it say? Ye shall be melted in the mist thereof. It's actually uh, um, kind of like a burning away, symbolized similar to like what's going to happen when Christ comes back and with his people his new Jerusalem is going to descend after the thousand years right fire is going to come down from heaven and what is it going to do it's going to consume and melt and burn everything here on this planet and then God's going to start new over again it's doing away with that's why with your brass your tin it's talking about an impure character some someone that has an impure character is like brass tin iron lead and silver dross does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Water. What about water? Okay, let's look at John 4, verse 14. What does water represent? Because water can represent uh, different aspects depending on the context of how it's used. John chapter 4. And verse 14. And it says, But whoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So what does the water represent in regards to the context of John 4 verse 14? It represents everlasting life. And who was Jesus speaking to when he said this? that water is representation of everlasting life. Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman. He asked her to give him some water, but she didn't want to. And she even told him, you don't even have any a cup to take it. And he said, well, uh, what if I give you water? The water you're getting from the well, it will come and go as you drink it. But the water I give you will last forever. And what is that water? Everlasting water. Okay, let's also look at Revelation 22 verse 17. Revelation 22, verse 17. It says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that hears say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. So it's similar to what Jesus said, the everlasting life. Here is talking about the water taken of in heaven, in the, in the new city. And let him take of the water of life freely. What is the water? Representative of everlasting life. Uh, this is a, also a symbol like when you go into baptism, what do you get baptized in? Water, right? And when you get baptized, you go into death as you go under and newness of life when you come out of water. So water is a, re a representation of life, everlasting life, and also sanctity. Let's look at Ephesians. Chapter 5, verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Ephesians is uh, another small book in the New Testament. Sometimes it's hard to find. Being a little difficult for me here. Okay, Ephesians 5, right, and verse 26. And it says, That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So water is a symbol of sanctifying. Now, look at your, uh, those of you who have your list, notice there's a difference. 
here in the three verses we read, it's talking about water, right? If you ask anybody in Bible prophecy, what does water symbolize? They will not talk about anything we just talked about. They will not talk about it symbolizing life. Why is that? Because they're thinking about the prophecy symbolic water. Now look at the next one. We have water that's talking about everlasting life. We read about in John 4, Revelation 22, and Ephesians 5, right? But look at the next one. What does the next one say? It's a plural. It's waters with an S. So sometimes people can confuse it. Now we have to remember or try and remember not to confuse the two. What does waters in the plural sense with an S mean? It's going to mean something completely different than just regular water. Now let's turn to Revelation 17 verse 15. Revelation 17 verse 15. We were here earlier. Revelation 17 verse 15. It says, Now he saith unto me, The waters, it's plural, which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are what? Peoples, multiple, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. So in Bible prophecy, we have beasts, we have horns that talk about kingdoms and kings and also in bible prophecy in in more in revelation this is where it uses the term of waters you'll find here that it represents multitudes it represents kingdoms or nations multitudes and tongues so it represents peoples as well so when it talks about in in prophecy if it sits amongst the waters in the in the it also talked about it sitting on a scarlet colored beast you remember that what is the beast of kingdom? But here it talks about sitteth upon the waters. It's sitting upon a populated place of peoples, nations, tongues, and languages. If I were to tell you that the, uh, the U.S. has many waters, what am I telling you? It has many people, different languages, right? Multitudes of people. It's very populated and filled. So that's one of the keys to understanding prophecy in regards to the book of Revelation is understanding what waters represents. Especially that will come in handy when we talk about the two beasts of Revelation chapter 13. One beast coming out of the water and the other beast coming out of the earth. So it's very important that we understand those two. Okay, Holy Spirit is a representative of the next one as fire. Now let's see what the what the Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 3 verse 16. Luke chapter 3 verse 16. It says John answered saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water. What is what is that symbol? What is John baptizing with? The plural water with peoples, nations and multitude or is he baptizing with just water which is what? A symbol of sanctify, sanctification, right? Never, never lasting life. So John is baptizing these people into the newness of life through water. But one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now we have the symbol of fire representing as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also resemble uh uh, symbolized as other elements as well such as oil uh, but here in this context is talking about fire when the Holy Spirit came down the Pentecost it was as a wind of fire right so fire represents the Holy Spirit um, but we have to uh, only understand that it's not always fire is not always a representation of the Holy Spirit when it talks about in the uh, in the in the scriptures when it talks about the um, the demons who are uh, representing themselves as apostles disciples or loved ones that come and try and trick the people of earth into thinking not to follow god right the demons who are trying to be like man uh coming in the in the what would you call it they're impersonating mankind right it says that they could call fire down from the sky that doesn't mean they're calling the holy spirit down it just means they're calling fire fireballs stuff like that down from the sky so we have to make sure we understand their interpretation. And here it tells us in the verse, in verse 16, He will baptize you, or not baptize you, but He will loose, He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, and with fire. So He's letting us know the fire rep is a representation of the Holy Spirit. Okay, what about trees? Now I'm just going to read some of these. 
Trees equal the cross, people, nations. I'll go ahead and let you read through that. There's some of these things on here that I want you to know, but as far as prophecy goes, it's not so much in detail that we need to understand those things because some of these are mainly uh, symbols for something that happened at that time, not something for prophecy that goes throughout the entire Bible. Uh, seeds are descendants. So let's look at that. Romans 9 verse 8. So Romans 9 verse 8. Romans 9 verse 8 it says, That is that which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So what does a seed mean? It means the descendants, right? So when kids are that their parents' seed and so on and so on, your ancestors, you're the seed of your ancestors. This is what seed means. No, it's not talking about the seed that's in the ground. It's talking about seed that are family members that are going on throughout the generations. Um, even if you have in the parables of the sower, right? The sower went forth to sow seed. The seed isn't just talking about plants. It's a symbolized or symbolism or analogy that the seed represents us, those that are the people of the earth, those that are eventually saved. Okay. Uh, fruit, works and actions. That's what the fruit represents. And in Galatians 5, I'll let you go ahead and read that. It's talking about the fruits of the Spirit, right? The, the fruits that you gain as you are on your walk with Christ. These fruits are... Um, talents that you have it's characteristics that you have so i'll let you go ahead and read galatians 5 when it gives you the fruits of the spirit talking about there a fig tree it says is a nation that should bear fruit now um jesus actually cursed the fig tree which was a representation of israel and the reason why he cursed the fig tree is because Israel decided not to teach the world about God and prepare uh, the world for, for uh, the second coming. Instead, they kept it to themselves and they didn't fulfill God's commission. So he cursed the fig tree because it was a sim, uh, symbolic representation of the nation of Israel. Kind of like how we talked about last week where different nations have... Um, animals as their representatives different sports team have animals as a representative fig trees were the representative of the of the Jewish people so it represents that the nation should bear fruit because a fig tree is a, a, a fruit bearing tree have any of you ever had figs fresh off the tree before they're the nastiest things at least in my mind some people like them I don't like them I only like them in fig newtons but I don't like them off the the tree to me they're kind of gross but anyway okay so a vineyard it's a church that should bear few bear fruit as we know a vineyard is what it's a it's a it's a crop of grapes right and if you want to make money off that or if you want to eat off of it well it has to bear fruit the field is the world the harvest is the end of the world uh, reapers are angels thorns and thorny grounds are the cares of life now those I would like for you to read on your own they don't so much they do go into Bible prophecy but it's not the type of prophecy we're gonna be talking about here at least at, at any given time here in the future it's talking about other things they're mainly teaching lessons rather than they are about prophecy okay now let's go to stars what do they represent in the Bible because there is a big misunderstanding of what stars represent in the Bible and we are not talking about the stars that you go outside at night and see we're talking about something else okay Revelation chapter 1 let's turn there Revelation chapter 1 remember everything we're talking about is about Bible prophecy driven how to understand and interpret what the Bible is actually speaking about you know what I just remembered uh, we never did pray to start off with, do we? Yeah, we did pray, right? Yeah, we did. Okay, never mind. Okay, see, I tell you, even before your very eyes, I'm losing my mind. Okay, so Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. What do stars represent? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength then we go on to verse 20 
The mystery of the seven stars, which they say were in his hand, right? The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are what? The angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are seven churches. So there it gives us two understandings of what the candlesticks represent. It's giving sanctuary language here, but it's telling us what stars represent in the book of Revelation. Now the book of Revelation, not only is there prophecy in it, but it's also a lot of symbology. So what do stars represent according to the book of Revelation? They represent uh, angels. That's what stars represent. Now let's go on to the next one. Uh, chapter 12 and verse 4 of the book of Revelation. It's going to talk about some more stars. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. It says, And his tail drew... Now this is talking about the dragon or Satan. Okay? When he was thrown out of heaven. And, and the, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Right? So we know heaven is in the sky outside this planet. Right? Where God dwells, that's where heaven is. So here, if you read it literally, it says that wherever heaven is, when Satan, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast into the earth what is that really talking about now people like to read revelation literal it's not a literal book it's a symbolic book and you have to make understanding on the bible symbols now if we take this verse just literal based off the first part of what we read what can we tell eight satan has a tail maybe that's why he's called the dragon right dragons have tails so he was kicked out of the heaven he has a tail and his tail drew how many uh, stars it says a third part of the stars out of heaven and they cast them to the earth now if we were to take it literal that they were literal stars how big is a star a star in the sky is a sun right that's what a star is now a star has different meanings it can mean a planet it can mean a galaxy just basically whatever you see in the night sky we call those stars but in its literal term, it's talking about the big ball gases that our planets surround, which are suns. Those are normally what stars are. Now, if he drew, Satan drew a third part of heaven, of the stars of heaven, and they cast them to the earth, do we see a third of the stars in heaven here on earth? It's not possible, right? That's like the sun is just one sun. Imagine dragging it to the earth. We cannot take this literal at all. It has to be symbolic, right? But you'd be surprised on how many people actually take Revelation uh, quite literal. So here in verse 4, it talks about it drew a third part of the stars from heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon, who we found out last week, is Satan, right? Stood before the woman, which we found out was a church, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. If we take the interpretation and the understanding about what happened in heaven, who can we conclude that the, the stars are? We are told when Satan uh, had worn heaven with Jesus, Jesus prevailed and kicked him and those that followed him out of heaven. Now, who are those stars that were cast out of heaven to this earth that followed Satan. That's why it uses the term a tail. Because a tail, you're following them. The stars are following the tail of, this, of, of uh, Satan himself. Who are those stars? It's the evil angels that were in heaven that decided to follow uh, Satan instead of following Jesus. So whenever you find the term in Bible prophecy or, or in Revelation talking about stars, it is talking about angels whether good or bad depending on the context. Revelation 12 is, is talking about the bad context, okay? Revelation 1 is talking about the good context, the good angels. So depending on the context, whether they're good or bad, but stars are always uh, in regards to angels. Was there a question? No? Okay. So let's go on. Jordan represents death. Uh, mountains are political or uh, religious political powers. Let's just go ahead and read one or two verses of mountains. Isaiah, let's pick Isaiah 2, verse 2 and 3. Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains 
and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of the Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord of Jerusalem. So here, a mountain represents a, a religious power. Now, when you have the story of the woman at the well, she constantly asked Jesus, or she not constantly, but she asked Jesus, where do we worship, on this mountain or that mountain? And Jesus told her, no, you'll, there's going to come a time when you don't worship on either mountain. But there is a mountain coming in which all will worship. Now, as far as symbolized, does anyone know what that mountain is? The mountain is, now remember, we're talking about a religious power, okay? And it says political power on your sheet, which it's a political power here on earth, but coming soon it's going to be a religious power. Now, the Jewish temple sat on top of a mountain, right? That's not the mountain we're talking about. The true mountain that we're talking about, that was talking about in Isaiah, because it mentions Zion, the true mountain it's talking about is the kingdom of God. Now, we haven't went through the understanding or the, or the study yet, excuse me, the study yet, but many of you have done Daniel chapter 2 already, right? And you have that image of all the kingdoms that are representative of metals, but what happens at the end of that prophecy? A great big mountain, which is cut out without hands, does what? It strikes the image at its feet and destroys it completely and it fills the whole earth, right? What is that representation of that mountain? It's God's kingdom at the second coming, okay? It's when he's going to destroy all kingdoms on earth. So this mountain is the representation of a religious power. It's just this mountain hasn't came yet. Now, figuratively, symbolically, there are different mountains in the Bible. As I said, in Jewish temple or in the Sumerian, uh, not some, yeah, the Samaria temple. But this mountain is talking about that great big mountain that's going to come when Jesus comes the second time. So mountains are religious, political powers and you can read that there's all the scripture text right there now what about the rock the rock we find as a representation of jesus or the truth it's not a represent representation of peter although some catholics try to teach that uh, when jesus was speaking to peter he says upon this rock he was talking about himself because even the bible refers to him as the chief cornerstone and when you build a building of stone, you need that cornerstone that starts off the building process that holds everything up. So Jesus is the rock. He is the true cornerstone. Peter was one of the small building pieces that went towards the building that were going to help build the church. But he is not the corner foundation. Jesus is. Then you have the sun, which is a representation of the gospel or representation of Jesus. Now mix, many people mix this up because... They um, uh, confuse this with pagan teaching in uh, pagan societies, especially amongst the Catholic Church. I will say Catholicism is pagan because they worship other gods, um, um, especially the sun, right? They, they do worship the sun. They worship on the sun's day, which is Sunday, the first day of the week, uh, which is the day that all pagans worshiped, right? So it's the sun is a represent in the Bible is a representation of Jesus or the gospel it's never a representation of a pagan God unless there's a scripture in I don't have it here yes there's a scripture in Ezekiel I do not have it here I wish I would have remembered but it talks about the sun now this is as far as I know the only context in which it talks about paganism because it's trying to prove a point where it's talking about uh, the sanctuary. Man, there's so much to tell you guys. Uh, it's talking about the sanctuary. And inside the sanctuary, I know you guys at Pathfinder study the sanctuary, right? And you know that there's only one door in the sanctuary, right? One door to go in, one door to come out. There's just one way in, one way out. Now, in the sanctuary, it was to uh, be designed a certain way. But it was to be placed in position in a certain way as well. It was to be positioned where the door uh, was to be faced on the east side 
to the west now so if this was east which in if you're looking at me east is on my right side west is on my left side the door would be faced right here and the temple would be faced right here now there's a purpose for that why because the entrance door is on the east side now when the priest would go into the door into the sanctuary on the east side the sun was rising and as they entered into the door what would be on their backside the sun right backside your backside when you turn your back on somebody that is a symbolism of what you're rejecting them right you're going against them well and with the priests when they go in through the door they're having their backside to the sun because they're going against sun worship which was paganism at the time now at the end of the day when they would close up all of the rituals there in the sanctuary and they would all go out the door what was transpiring at the end of the day now the sun was on the west side setting their back was still continually to the sun so in all aspects of all worship through the sanctuary system they're rejecting sun worship which was the majority of worship through the pagans at the time so while in the bible the sun represents jesus and truth also in the pagan world every represents false worship false gods but in that one context in ezekiel it's showing in that sense that the sun represents a false god but it tells you that it just doesn't say uh the sun glared onto this no it tells you that the sun is a pagan uh symbol at that time i just want to throw that out there i don't know am i boring you guys is this okay go ahead okay well let, let's see Ezekiel 8.16. See, I'm like Doug Bastard and you're my John Ross because you're looking up the, the text for me. <laughs> okay, let's see what it says. Um, I don't think it's 8.16. Oh, wait, I'm in the wrong book. Never mind. Well, it kind of talks about the opposite way. It, it talks about them um, putting their backs towards the temple of the Lord and they're facing towards the east, worshiping the sun. Yeah, yeah. In that context, what it, what it's teach, speaking about? That's the teaching lesson. So let's see, eighteen verse six, sixteen or eight, uh, sixteen. Ezekiel eight verse sixteen. Okay, so yeah, and these these people that it's talking about in Ezekiel were actually sun worshippers. Okay, so that's why it's talking about different. So verse sixteen it says, let's read, let's go back up to verse fourteen. So eight fourteen. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now Tammuz is a pagan god. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see great abominations in these. And she brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were five and twenty men, uh, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east and they worship the sun towards the east then he said unto me hast thou seen this O son of man it is a light thing in the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here now what transpired notice what what tribe did it say that this is happening to the tribe of Judah right now if I remember my history correct where was the descendants of the Samaritans from? They were from the tribe of Judah. And the Samaritans not only worshipped God, but they worshipped other pagans as well, pagan gods. And here you find them in the, at the door of the Lord's house facing what direction? Facing east at sunrise. So they were actually facing the sun to worship it in the morning. Um, this is why you have... Uh, some pagan this is <laughs> okay <laughs> this is why you have issues with christians celebrating christmas okay because during the time of christmas it's an actual pagan ho holiday um you know it's it's the time it's the it's the rebirth of the sun because the sun the sun died in a sense that's why you have shorter days and then after after this Christmas time, then the sun was going to start getting brighter and the days are going to start getting longer, right? It was a rebirth every year. 
So they celebrated this as a holiday. This instance is not like like that, but they're worshiping it on a daily basis. And so that's why God had designed the temple in a certain manner. Because sun worship is not something that only goes back to just this time. During the time of the Israelites coming out of Babylon and others. But it was actually going dating back to the time of Cain. That's where sun worship started. Okay. So, and you could even give some arguments about Babylon. That that's where it initiated. But there's evidence to go back to Cain. So... This is why God had that temple designed that certain way. Now, I know we went off on a lot of things. It's just we have to understand because there are some people who take the Bible understanding of the sun and say, look, they're talking about worshiping the sun. It's a, it's a pagan object. We shouldn't be worshiping it. But in its context, it's talking about Jesus. It's talking about the gospel. Um, uh, we're told to let her light shine, right? Uh, we're told that the, the woman in Revelation 12 has the moon lit on her. We're, well, we're, does the moon actually have light? No, the moon doesn't have light source, right? What is it? It's a reflection of the sun, right? The moon is reflecting upon this woman, which is the church. So the moon is actually kind of symbolized as a church itself. And what is the moon reflecting off? The sun. What are we supposed to reflect on? The Bible says that Jesus says that he is the light of the world. But not only is he the light of the world, but what does the Bible say is the light of the world? You and I, believers, when they see us, what are they supposed to see? They're supposed to be see Jesus, right? We're supposed to be reflections of him. So when you use that understanding and symbology, you can come up with uh, the proper understanding of the symbols. See how confusing it can be, Bible symbols? And if someone doesn't have a, a thorough knowledge of Scripture and, and, and just believes whatever they're told, they can believe all kinds of crazy, crazy things. Okay, so winds. Let's go to winds. What does winds represent? Uh, let's go to Jeremiah, the first verse that you have on your list. Jeremiah 25. Verse 31 through 33. And thank you for finding that scripture. I always, always bring that scripture up and I always forget where it's at. Jeremiah 25, verse 31 through 33 says a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth for the lord hath a controversy with the nations he will plead with all flesh he will give them that are wicked uh, to the sword saith the lord thus saith the lord of hosts behold evil shall go forth from nation to nation and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth and the slain of the lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth unto even the other end of the earth they shall not be lamented neither gathered nor buried they shall be dung upon the upon the ground he's speaking here in the book of jeremiah chapter 25 he's speaking here about the second coming of christ now in the book of revelation it talks about angels that are on the four corners of the earth and they're holding back the winds of strife Meaning there's going to be a great event that's going to happen, which we call the plagues. And the angels are holding it back. And why are they holding back these winds of strife and these plagues? Because the Bible says he wants them to hold it back until the people of God can be sealed. Now what does Jeremiah tell us here in this text? Let me reread it. A noise shall come to all the ends of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. But he is pleading with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth, and the slain of the Lord shall be on that day from one end to the earth unto the other. He's speaking about when the gospel is going out through the three angels' message and the latter rain hits, the word is going out everywhere. And the winds of strife cannot be released yet because it's not their time. Once the Sunday law is passed, those winds are released and they go from one corner of the globe to the other, surrounding all the earth. 
and then you have all this violence that's transpiring but as soon as that violence starts it's going to end with jesus coming and slaying everyone on the earth that's not a believer because as the bible says his presence of god is like a fire a great fire well when he comes all those that are not following him they will be burnt up by the glory of god so i'll let you read the other verses as well but that right there if you study revelation along with the prophetic books of jeremiah daniel you'll come to these understandings which we will study them uh, depending on how far we go into prophecy okay two miscellaneous objects okay okay man we're like an hour and 20 minutes in should we stop <laughs> let's cover these last two here the lamp and oil and then we'll stop i didn't realize that uh it was that far ahead in time okay so the lamp the word of god let's go to psalms 119 verse 105 psalms 119 verse 105 okay it says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path so what does the lamp represents the word of god right it lights your path it lights the way in which you should go whenever you're in a dark place you need a light in order to know where you're going and that's what the word of god does okay what about oil we talked about this earlier as we talked about fire was a representation of the holy spirit so is oil so let's look at revelation 4 5 Revelation 4 5 and it says and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and there was seven lamps of burning fire burning the throne which are the seven spirits of God now it's the seven spirits of God it's talking about the church and the candlestick in which is in the sanctuary is filled with oil which keeps the fire burning constantly daily right when you read through the earlier parts of Revelation, it talks about the candlestick, the seven branch candlesticks, is a symbol of the church. But what keeps the church going, what keeps the church on fire, what keeps the church going back to God? Now we learned that a lamp is what? The word of God, right? The, the, the seven branch candlestick is a type of lamp because it lights the way. But what lights the way for God's people into understanding according to the Bible in all ways to know about Jesus? The Holy Spirit. So you have the Holy Spirit symbolizes fire. What fuels that fire? The oil that's in the lamp. And what is the lamp's purpose that's filled with oil? It's the fuel. Fire, which is the result. What is that purpose? To teach people the Word of God. You can add these three symbols in together. It just says it for itself so is there questions no can't see anybody else out there no one really has their video on okay well if there's no other questions uh, let's see here we we didn't cover that much because there was a lot into it um, but for those of you who do have your paper you can also go into the rest that we have here um, the other portion of what we have to study and the symbols is like the sword bread wine clothing crown uh, a seal what does that mean we are probably gonna end next week with just the symbols themselves in their understandings and after next week we'll probably depending start maybe on Daniel the book of Daniel and go from there um, yes Vicki all the information that I sent on the paper through email uh, everything's in there it's everything I'm reading on my screen is everything I sent you so for those of you who are listening if you don't have uh, the Bible prophecy symbols chart uh, which I sent out earlier this week just let me know and I can email them to you for those of you on the group page if you want the same thing just private message me your email I did put them on the group page for you guys to see them but I know because of the way Facebook only allows me to put them on there, it's it's only in picture form, not in document form. So I could just easily email them to you. And next week, we'll like I said, we'll stop with the Bible symbols because we'll pretty much cover them all. 
I know there's numbers in prophecy, but instead of studying the numbers themselves, when we actually go through prophecy, you'll just see them. We don't need to do an individual study on the numbers like we have to do everything else because they'll actually be used through the prophecy and we'll see why. So we might after next week cover Daniel depending on what you guys want to cover first. Um, but Daniel sets the tone for everything else especially in, um, in, the, in the book of Revelation. And then there's also prophecies that we can go on through and through Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, when we talk about the Messiah, the prophecies of the Messiah. So it's really up to you guys on what you want to do. I know Alyssa wanted to know about the 2300 days, which is later on in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, right? There's also the 70 weeks, 69 weeks, 1260 days, the 1335, the 1290. All these lessons comprise the 2300 days. So when we do actually study the 2300 days, it might be four or five presentations to just to study the 2300 day prophecy. But that will come if we start on the book of Daniel, that will come when we go to chapter eight and we'll study all those things. And the 2300 day prophecy covers thousands of years. Um, so we'll be able to see all, all of what's transpiring. And, uh, I sh and when we do the 2300 day prophecy, I can actually send you my slide presentation and notes on um, what everything means. So that way if you need it for later on, you'll have it. I believe I still have my notes. Back then I used to do everything by memory, so I believe I have my notes that I made last. Um, anything else? So we'll cover Bible symbols next week. And then uh, let me know what you want to cover for the week after. And we'll, we'll go through there. Uh, for those know, of you, okay, go ahead. I, I know Alyssa also mentioned she wanted to study America's role in Bible, in Bible prophecy. Yeah. Right? With, with, okay, so with any study in prophecy, we have to have a foundation. Okay? If we were to study Bible prophecy now, as far as the U.S. role in Bible prophecy, I'm going to have to cover a lot of Daniel in order to go into that prophecy. So in order to cover Revelation, we have to start in Daniel first. Okay, we need a firm foundation. This is why for some of you guys that have went through private, uh, prophecy seminars, they talk about not only prophecy through Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Revelation 13, Revelation 12, 17, and 18, 22. They talk about both books, but then they add in like uh, what the Bible says about death, what the Bible says about health, money, all those things. Because all those teachings in the middle are all going to culminate towards what's going to happen at the end. So we have to have a full understanding of a bunch of things as we build a house with a firm foundation before we get into those big topics. I could tell you now what the U.S. has to do in prophecy. We could just read Revelation 12. But as we do that, in what people uh, who are not familiar with the U.S. and prophecy is the Bible does not come out clear to talk about the United States. It doesn't say the U.S., right? It does not say that. It mentions it a completely different way. But how do you know that the way it's speaking about is talking about the United States? Well, Revelation is not only written in, symbol, in, symbol, in symbols, but it's written in historical events. And if you don't understand the historical events as one happened after another, then you're not going to understand when Revelation 13 talks about the United States. Because you're going to be, well, that could be any, any talking about any type of kingdom or, 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 or government, but yet without understanding the history and how the Bible is going, well, then you, you won't get it. And not only is it just biblical knowledge that we need to have in as far as the U.S. and Bible prophecy, there's a lot of history that I need to bring out. Quotes from presidents, quotes from the founders, quotes from people later on in, in the United States that showed us that this was truly the actual beast that Revelation talks about. So it's it's we'll get there. Trust me, we'll get there. But it's going to take some time because we have to build that foundation first. If it turns out we're just going to get there, well, we'll get there. But it's going to be a multiple presentation because we're going to have to build up to when the Bible talks about the U.S. and prophecy. But it does talk about the U.S. It just calls it something different. 
Anything else? No? You guys, you guys are also welcome to invite people to this. If, if there's somebody that's interested that you know of, give them the meeting number and password. Just uh, text me and let me know who's on here so we could just make sure that it's, you know, of course, uh, nobody gets in here that is not supposed to be, and we got to watch what they do on here. So just, um, but they're welcome to join in, you know, adults too. Um, anybody who's interested in learning about prophecy, I, I'm in here too. I'm in here too to learn and to refresh myself because we know prophecy is hard, right? I, I think so anyways. And so um, it's to refresh my memory as well, as well as others that are on here. Um, so invite them if they're welcome to join in. Yeah, and someone asked on the Facebook group page, uh, what about the seed and the mountain? What about uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, when it talks about if you have faith, uh, uh, faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. When it comes to Bible prophecy, we're actually talking about Bible prophecy. Uh, when it comes to uh, Matthew chapter 17 and 20, it's talking about uh, a parable illustration. It's talking about your faith. It's, it, there's nothing prophetic about that verse. He's just teaching you um, what type of faith you should have. So if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, yes, it's talking about a seed, but it's talking about a mustard seed, and it's talking about faith. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, which is really small, it says that you could move mountains, right? Now, in a sense, it says mountains, yes, but it's not talking about literal mountains. It's not talking about if I had faith, I could go move the Sandias or I could go move Mount Everest. It's talking about the mountains that are against you. And what are those mountains? It's the sin that's in your life that you're having trouble with. The trials that are in your life. So it's he's talking about a teaching lesson in a, in a parable sense. It's not talking about prophecy. So we cannot apply the same meanings to this that we talked about earlier. Because it's, there's nothing prophetic about this uh, text in Matthew 7 verse 20, 17 verse 20. It's just a teaching lesson. And he, it just so happens he's using a mustard seed and a mountain. So that, but that's a good, uh, that's a good example to show how uh, how we can confuse sometimes uh, prophecy with uh, regular texts or teachings that the Bible's talking about. Because that happens all the time, and uh, you'll find that there are teachings that are going around the church these days right now that they are misusing. Uh, Richard should know what I'm talking about. This I won't say what it is, but there are people who are using certain texts to uh, promote a theory okay i'll say it that way uh, and the, that theory is uh the reading of text out of context the reading of text by misapplying what the literal sense and the symbolic text are, are trying to say and that's where a lot of us get in trouble where we get into these fanciful theories uh and and, and other types of teachings it's because we don't let the bible interpret itself we just want uh, the Bible to uh, say what we're thinking already. And uh, that's not the way to study scripture. Anything else? Hey, Ray, I got something. Uh, is Richard, uh, Amazing Facts has a study guide, study guide 21, it's USA uh, in Bible Prophecy. Yeah. It's pretty good. It's very sweet. Gives you good little foundation. Say that again. You were breaking up after you uh, mentioned the, the the study guide. Oh yeah, the study guide. It's, it's number twenty one. It's USA and Bible prophecy. Yeah, I, Alyssa, if you want to just look at that, you can. Um, but <laughs> just to show you that what I said earlier is true, Amazing Facts breaks up breaks up its lessons. So the first thirteen lessons have to do with foundational. And the last lessons, verse, uh, lesson 14 through 27, are completely prophecy. So they, they actually give you a half of, the, half of the, the whole 27 lessons first. And then that way you can build your foundation and understanding, which a lot of it's Daniel and basic understandings of teachings of the Bible. Then your next section is just pure prophecy. So even when you understand the, or when you get the lesson of America and prophecy, which is what number? number what 21 I think, it was 20, I think it was 21 okay so you have already what six or six lessons before that which are talking about the beast power and and the mark of the beast to set you up 
to understand um, the U.S. in prophecy. So it's doing the same thing that I would do. It's just, but it has the study guide there if you want to just look for it. Um, um, but it's, it's, you can read it and understand it. I don't, I don't think there's no, no question on that. But you still need that history in order to confirm it even more, which is the, the lessons before that. So that's why we would do it in the same structure. But you can, yeah, if you want to, go to amazingfacts.org, go to their media section and free Bible studies, and then just go to uh, the Amazing Facts study guides. And they're all there to read um, uh, for free online. Uh, you could even download them to your phone or your tablet for free and have them there. Uh, or if you want to, um, just download the, you don't even have to go online, just download the app of uh, AF Mobile. And um, that's everything that Amazing Facts has. It's a free app. You can do the Sabbath school lessons on there. And you can also get every single study guide uh, that they have on there. You know those little track books? They're all on there as well. Um, you can get all those there. Um, if, if, uh, if any of you want them in computerized, let me know. I can get you all the lessons. I have them on my computer. I, give me a thumb drive. I could just give you everything. Um, so you can have those as well but yeah you could go online and you can read it but uh, you're still gonna need some of that history on it in order to fully understand but if you want to have it just to I guess fulfill your palate right now Lisa you could just go on and read it and that would just help you even more because when we cover it you'll remember the things you read and you'll be just a little bit more prepared okay. anything else Okay, well, I guess if there's no questions, no comments, no complaints, uh, why don't we go ahead and let's just uh, end with prayer. I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Vicky. Uh, wait, wait. So, when you... so, just to let you know before you ask your question, I do uh, not, I do not know the Muffin Man. <laughs> oh, <see. laughs> okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh yeah. Foundation that you were gonna talk about. Yeah. Uh, does that fall in like the category of like uh, the lead and all that fell into? No, because they're different foundational stones. Uh, I'll just go okay. ahead and I'll just go ahead and read them to you. Uh, one is jasper, sapphire, uh, chalcedony, emerald. Uh, forgive me my pronunciations. Uh, sardonyx, sardius. Crystallite, beryl, topaz, um, chrysopheris, uh, jacinth, and amethyst. Um, and what the reason why these are in Bible prophecy here is because not only do you find them on the on the the um, uh, foundational stones that are underneath the the city, you also find some of these stones in Bible prophecy. Now we talked about sapphire already, right? I believe Vicky, you already heard that presentation I gave on sapphire. Uh, it, how it represents the law of God but there's other stones on here that other, represent other portions of different things that are found in the Bible not only are they foundational stones but they they symbolize something else there's also stones that are on the priest uh, ephod uh, right the Urim and the Thummim right but also these these stones are representations of 12 tribes and you'll find on the ephod of the high priest uh, right here in the middle on his chest plate, he has these stones there because they're symbolized of the 12 tribes, okay? Which the number 12 represents other things too. We'll get into that later. So these stones are used in biblical prophecy, but they're also used in Bible teachings of the sanctuary and other methods of uh, learning the Christian walk. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. I can't wait to learn that. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? That's it. Anybody else? No? Okay, well, it was a good hour and 40 minutes. <laughs> How many of you think this was long? Raise your hand. Give me a thumbs up. <laughs> this is nothing. It went fast. Huh? It, went fast. it does go fast. If any of you are... 
if any of you are on my Bible page, which some of you are on Facebook, we do the Sabbath school lesson every week. This morning for church, how long does our Sabbath school lesson go? It goes for an hour, right? But on our Bible, on my Bible page, we do the Sabbath school lesson. It takes us like three hours to study the Sabbath school lesson. That's how in depth we go into the Sabbath school lesson each week. So you know, to me, this isn't long. But for other people, it's long. But to me, this is what I enjoy studying the Bible. So it could take however long it takes. I really don't care. The only thing that's going to stop me is is when Jessica comes and hits me because I'm taking too long. <laughs> so Because she needs help with the kids. So I can stay doing this all the time. But I, ha I can't. I have to limit my time. But, you know, I just hope that this was... Uh, you enjoyed it and you took a lot ah, can we speak I hope you enjoyed it but also you got a lot of understanding about the Bible symbols and as we go through the prophecy itself while we study the Bible these are just gonna be popping up if you have a good memory you're gonna be like oh yeah this is what he talks about this is why it means that and and you're gonna see him come together and it's gonna be so repetitive because Bible prophecy is is that you're you're just gonna get it and if you don't get it that's okay when it comes up you just ask a question I explain and then we go from there and we continue on so that's it so let's go ahead and close our uh, prophecy class for this week and we'll uh, continue on and end next week let us close with the word of prayer loving Heavenly Father once again we thank you for all the things that you have done for us here this afternoon we thank you Heavenly Father for the understanding of Bible prophecy symbols and I know Heavenly Father it could get quite detailed and maybe um, repetitive or boring at times but we just pray that you'll fill us with the spirit of learning, a spirit of wanting to understand, because all these things are here to tell us about your son. And we just pray that as we continue on, that you will just continue blessing us as we read your word, and that you'll bless us as we continue on in our Sabbath day. We just thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you who are on the Facebook page, do not go anywhere yet. Okay, we'll see you guys next week. Those of you on Zoom, and uh, have a good rest of your Sabbath. Bye. Okay, guys, there on the Facebook page, that's our end for our Bible prophecy class. I just want to let you know that here in a bit, I'm not sure how long, uh, depending on the time frame that I'm able to schedule out, we will redo Sabbath school. I know we had some issues this morning because I was having connectivity issues. I'm not sure why that was transpiring, but it seems it's a common thing with Facebook the past couple of weeks when we go on live. It's just having some issues so uh, we'll go ahead and do Sabbath school and we'll redo it and uh, we'll do that in depth uh, for those of you who maybe just want to watch what I did this morning you can go to the live feed of the church service this morning just watch it there but here soon we'll be coming up with the Sabbath school lesson and I hope you were able to do the lesson for the week and I hope you all have questions and comments so that way I'm not the only one talking but that we can have a discussion together so thank you for uh, being here with this Bible prophecy class and we'll see See you here in a little bit when we review the Sabbath School lesson. God bless and we'll see you in a bit.